Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Jamie Swift. I am the executive director of Black Women Radicals. Thank you so much for being here with us. And um, I have the amazing honor and pleasure to be speaking with Dr. Imani Perry, even though she told me to call her Imani. I'll introduce you as Dr. Imani Perry. Um, and we are in conversation about her amazing book, Breathe, a letter to my sons. And so thank you so much, um, Imani, for being here with us. And uh, I haven't been able to sleep because I've been so excited to speak with you so and nervous. So thank you so much for being here. I'm so delighted to be here. Thank you. And I want to give a shout out to Haymarket Books. Thank you for curating this wonderful event and also for the amazing other events that you have been putting on this year, particularly. We definitely need it. So thank you so much um, for everything for that one. But before we get started, I really want to properly introduce our wonderful guest, Dr. Perry. I'm going to read her bio. Um, so Dr. Imani Perry is the Hughes Rogers Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University, where she also teaches in programs in law and public affairs and gender and sexuality studies. Perry, who holds a BA from Yale University and a PhD in American Studies and a law degree from Harvard University, is a native of Birmingham, Alabama, and spent much of her youth in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Chicago. She is the author of six books, including the 2019 NAACP Image Award nominee, May We Forever Stand, A History of the Black National Anthem, Vexy Thing on Gender and Liberation, and Looking for the Rain, The Radiant and Radical Life of Lorraine Hansberry, which won the 2019 Penn Jacqueline Bograd Weld Award for Biography and was a New York Times Notable Book of 2018. She lives outside Philadelphia with her two sons, Freeman Diallo Perry Robb and Issa Garner Robb. So thank you so much, Dr. Perry. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. So um, reading your book uh, conjured so many emotions in me um, as a person who does not have children, but who wants to have children one day and wonders if she can have children one day. All these thoughts um, and themes of fear, of naming, of inheritance um, really brought up powerful emotions. Um, but before we really get started and getting into the little bit of the heavy conversation, I really want to ask you and ground this conversation in how are you feeling and what is giving you joy these days? Oh, I mean, so I am feeling um, distressed, you know, I mean, I think I, I'm, I've, I've committed to being manage it with the kind of confidence and, you know, confidence about, but this is hard. I think it's hard. I'm worried about um, our environment. I'm worried about COVID. I'm worried about all of the suffering. I'm worried about the pen what's going to happen in winter with so many people who have no money and no employment. And um, so I'm generally distressed um, and What's bringing me joy, I mean, it's, it is really always my children. Um, you know, they are, I, you know, a comp I absolutely adore them. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, it is this reminder that one has to, you know, Mariam uh, Kaba talks about hope as a discipline. Um, and I used to, I used to say, um, uh, what, how did I say it? I said it's, it's a slightly different hope is praxis, but I like discipline even more um, because, and so, you know, children are the reminder of that. Oh, they're big, they're teenagers, but they're a reminder that you bring people into the world and you have a responsibility to commit to the world, even at moments that feel dire. And so that's my source of joy. That's my source of laughter. Um, and it's always, and always books. Night, um, and music. I mean, those are those sort of, those are the three poles and, and my family more broadly. Definitely. And thank you for sharing that and being honest. It is a dire time, a discouraging time. Uh, like we discussed before, um, before the call, just with the debate and everything, it, it's, we wonder where we're going um, in this, in this world. And, and I wanted to bring this all in because on um, page 71 of your book, uh, when, what you wrote really touched me. You said, I'm losing 
some of my ability to dream a world. Yes. And um, I feel like that statement speaks to a lot of us, particularly in the black community where we've come from, many of us come from, I mean, obviously coming from enslavement and nothing and building ourselves and a, a resilient group of people, but particularly 2020, many of us are having a hard time dreaming about a new world, a different world. And that brought me to Lucille Clifton's statement when she wrote, we cannot create what we cannot imagine. And so mm -hmm. with your sons, how do you have these very tough conversations um, so that they can not fall into not creating or not imagining or not dreaming of a new world because of all the pervasive anti-Black violence that's... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a complicated question. I think it's, one of the things that I think is important for adults um, and, and elders in communities, right, to do is to have, is to enter that conversation with some humility. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, this recognition that we do not have all the answers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's a dynamic relationship, like asking or thinking about how do we imagine our lives, our role in them, our role in, in our lives, our role in relationship to others. Um, for me, I mean, in particular, when Trump was elected, I thought, uh, and, you know, as a leftist, you know, I have always um, had a kind of fundamentally skeptical relationship to the presidency, right? I mean, I don't. And and honestly, anybody who wants to be the leader of the empire, I treat with profound skepticism. But something happened to me in that I thought my my mother grew up in a white nationalist state, Birmingham, Alabama, right? And now she has to return to the, and all the people who died mm -hmm. to inch forward, right, in that time and place to transform the world. And then, of course, all the prior generations. And with the sort of flip of a switch, you know, how much of that was erased? And I don't mean to suggest that there was some sort of, um, you know, pie in the sky panacea before, but there had been a social transformation that I could track in the difference between the three generations of women, you know, of the last three generations of women in my family. And so then for me, that was sort of this, it, it posed this question about what are we struggling for? What are the terms? Is this, is this a failed experiment? <laughs> and do we still stay here on these terms? I mean, it just, all of these questions flooded in with the kind of naked white supremacist ideology of the person um, who was leading the nation, right? And then how does one, um, also sort of dream a world that and to a certain extent just wanting to get things back to something other than a fever pitch of fascism and then struggling right you know so that even sort of this this question that we have to have this we have to ask we have to think about things on the current terms is profoundly disturbing right and so all that to say i was you know highly distressed um, distraught, um, and it has increased because things have gotten progressively worse as a, as a consequence of there being no consequence. So we're at a stage where things are lawless. And so, you know, for me, it is, as a parent, it's actually sort of pushing conversations about being kind of improvisational, questioning, um, not taking anything for granted, right, about the lives they build, where they build them, Right. How, you know, just the only steady thing is the values, right? The values, the love, the commitment. But the other stuff, I think we have to be, you know, just kind of radically um, open to thinking, where do we go from here? You know? Definitely. Um, this conversation reminds me of what my mother used to say um, as we become friends, as I've gotten older, older, not the that you my child and you do it as, do as I say, it's more of a friendship. But she used to say to me, she feared bringing children into this world because it was so wicked. Yeah. Um, and having these conversations with us about uh, you being different and not even knowing you're different, not realizing that you're different, not getting the chance to realize you are different um, and someone else telling you. And so when you were like this book really 
brought back those conversations of walking out the door or concerns about coming back in or even I'm, I'm, I'm grown, grown now. I pay my own bills, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm real grown, you know, can't yeah, tell yeah. me nothing now. No, but you know, even in that, it doesn't stop. And so to have these like radical conversations are so important and to be open and to be honest that, you know, we don't have all the answers. So, yeah, definitely. you know, it's funny. I had a, um, a, a really beautiful moment earlier this year when, um, my mother was an organizer and one of her friends um, brought materials like there were documents from when they were in various political organizations and gave them to me this summer. And the thing that was so great about that is that I could see my mother when she was her imagination, her political imagination was completely open. So these like so these formulations she said, these things that she said, and it was um there was something that was inspiring about the boldness of the imagination. And even though I'm older now than she was in that moment, it just was this reminder, right, of, um, you know, that of, of, of the beauty of, like, believing in possibility, right? Yeah. yeah, so. And we're the possibility because we're still here. Yeah. So definitely. Yep, yep, I'm still definitely. here. Definitely. And um, I really want to, I took statements and sentence or quotes that really resonated with me. So on page 121, you write, you know, a woman became a mother, you will know a mother is a woman. Yes. And I, you know, when you get older, you start realizing my parents are not just my parents, they are these whole human beings that were um human before they were like they were themselves before they met me and um you're really vulnerable in this book not just to your sons but to the world which I think takes so much courage um and so we learn a, a lot of things about you like your favorite song the Commodores Zoom we like you know that you like Limeade and of course we know you love to write and read books because you I don't know how you did that write so many books but that's another personal question I'm gonna ask you later on for my you know selfish reasons but how um, important is vulnerability in your relationship with your sons? I think it's incredibly important. So that line is an invocation of a line in Frederick Douglass's The Narrative of Frederick Douglass and this the chiasmus woman you've seen the chiasmus moment, right? You have seen how a man was made a slave, now you shall see a slave made a man, where he confronts the slave breaker, he fights back, right? This person who has been charged with breaking down the fact that he is headstrong and in, he fights back physically, right? And that's really the second mo movement of his self-emancipation. The first movement is literacy, the second movement. For me, that movement is actually a moment that precedes telling a story about vulnerability. Mm -hmm. right? And that one of the things that I think is essential and I think for, for, for women um, in rearing children is to actually insist that they witness what the kind of vulnerability that is part of that experience in order to cultivate sensitivity mm -hmm. and love and grace, right? And there's a way, there's this trope of the, this like the long suffering black mother who never complains and just takes everything. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, on, on the one hand, I think that that's not healthy for us, but it also, if we want to socialize the next generations into having a deeper kind of care and sensitivity to black women, which I think we do, mm -hmm. that we have to be vulnerable, right? We have to actually be willing to talk about stuff and to say, I, I need you to witness what we experience fully, mm -hmm. right? Right, not just be sort of the mama who manages everything, but what does it mean to be a black woman in particular in this society, which has always um, been a position of incredible duress and incredible responsibility. Definitely. Um, I appreciate your vulnerability, even talking about um, your quips and even how you feel like you failed and what you can do better because um, I do a lot of oral histories. I'm trying to collect oral histories from my family. Oh. And um, I was talking to my grandmother and my grandmom is like the matriarch 
uh, the mother of my ch of the church, um, loving, kind of praying, a Proverbs 31 woman, right? But when I asked her, you know, about her life, um, you know, it was this vulnerable moment because she had to go back and recall certain certain trauma, right? And I think sometimes we don't get to be vulnerable with our elders, particularly, or even our parents, because it conjures up all these emotions. And so there's like this wall there. And so I appreciate you kind of like breaking that down and, and yeah, showing that with your children. Yeah. It's, and it's hard, right? Because, mm -hmm. you know, as a nurturer, you, you want to, um, you want the young people in your midst to feel safe and secure. And so, you know, it's complicated. It's a complicated balance. Definitely. Now to my next selfish question, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, um, I'm just wondering your writing process. Like you've written so many books. Uh, my friend and I were talking, Zalika, and we're like, she wrote, she just wrote six books. I, I mean, um, and amazing, but was your writing, what is your writing process like in general? Yeah. And then two, was your writing process different for Breathe, would you say? Yes, okay, so yes, so, um, so I've never, I never can sort of focus on one subject ever, which is why I double majored in college. I went to graduate school in various areas. You know, I work on multiple books at the same time. It's just part of the way that my mind works. And in particular, I don't like to push when I doesn't, when I don't feel it. Like I, I don't, I, lo I don't like to put too much pressure on an idea. So if I'm at the computer and nothing is coming, I'm going to turn to something else. Or I'm going to read. I don't like, so I'm not the kind of person who's like, I get up and read, you know, right. Six to 8 AM every day. That would never work for me. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so part of what I found that my, pro and I think a lot of it is you have to find the process that works for you. Right. And th that's an individual thing, right? I do a lot of outlining. I move around with different ideas. I do a lot of note taking. I set things aside sometimes for years. <laughs> Back to that. You know, really, like I, you know, and I'll, and and um, the, the the wonderful thing about being both a scholar and a writer is these are long careers, right? It's not like being, you know, an athlete or a dancer where you really have to do it when you're young. I can, you know, have a good you know, potentially 30 more years of this, right? So it's not, there's not a rush. And that lets, that actually lets me be more productive as opposed to the, the sense that there's time. Mm -hmm. um, so I do a lot of outlining um, and I do a lot of reading for writing, um, a lot of reading. Um, and, but with Breathe, Breathe was different because my life was different. I mean, I wrote most of it when I was in Japan and Kyoto with my kids mm -hmm. um, and I was teaching. And so my schedule was just, I mean, usually my life is harried. Like I have all these obligations all the time. You know, I, I wasn't driving. I took the train to work. I walked along the river every morning. And then I had all these hours each morning, in part because my, my, my sons wanted to keep their schedule such that they could talk to their friends in the States. So like I had hours in the morning where I was just free. <laughs> and so I just wrote. And I was writing without footnotes. I was writing, you know, all not of the So it was a much quicker process and it, it was a freeing process, you know. Um, so instead of citations, all the thinkers who influenced me, it's Morrison, Du Bois, um, Baldwin, and, you know, all, they just kind of flow June Jordan. They, they could flow, right? And I was, you know, I would look at them sleeping, my children, and think, what is it that they need to confront the world? What are the lessons that I have had that I need to impart, not just to them, but asking, thinking about the other witnesses, readers. And so um, it was a great, it was a great process. It was, it, it was, it wasn't quite the most fun. The most fun book to write was um, um, May We Forever Stand, which is on Lift Every Voice and Sing, but it was up there. I really, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Was it more, um, um, obviously because it's your children, was it more emotional? Then, then, like, you really had to, like, I mean, you had me crying. I mean, it, it reminds me of, like, my mom wrote me letters as a, as a child, and I still have the cards and everything that she's given to me. So, like, how was that? Was it like a purging process? 
Well, that's it's so interesting you say that because a lot of what actually made its way in the book I had written in various ways to them before as letters, right? So it wasn't totally new. Mm-hmm. Um, it was more intimate. Um, you know, the stakes are somewhat different, but everything I write is deeply emotional, right? It all, you know, I, I used to say I've never written a book that doesn't have as as, as its center my grandmother's life. Um because she's sort of, you know, what is, I mean, she's sort of my anchor for thinking through the world, right? This, you know, this woman who, you know, was a domestic and had 12 children and, you know, born and born and raised in rural Alabama and, and, um, and who was our caretaker, you know, was my primary caretaker when I was young. And so I, you know, so it's always emotional because, she's at the center. There's another level when it's your children and when you're trying to think through what is this world I have brought them into. Um, but it's an extension of, you know, it's like these kind of like different iterations of the core value. I mean, I have maybe forever stand begins with them, you know, oftentimes with my kids. I mean, so often, so the people I love are always present. I'd say that way. Yeah. Definitely. And I, and going into the next question, um, I'm going to read, something that you wrote on page 141 of your book, you write breathing life back into the past, pulling from the ranks of your history is how you build yourself. And um, throughout that section and when you were just writing, it reminded me of the the con word of Sankofa, go back and get. And um, when you're talking to your sons about the many strands of inheritances that they, they have, whether known or unknown, and so you speak a lot about Alabama, your grandmother, your mother. So how has, for the readers who don't know, but how has the South shaped you? Yeah. And why, why, why do you have to always go back to the South and go back and get at it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's home, you know. So I, um, although I, I left relatively young, where the vast majority of my family is, where I went, you know, that's the place we had a house that's the place I always say that's the place that I learned to um walk talk read and dance Mm -hmm. and so it's the it's my anchor um um and I do think and so and so I and I also think a lot about um the ancestors you know Mm -hmm. um because there are moments where we can get overwhelmed by um the depth and comprehensiveness of injustice and I think okay but somebody chose to you know to live and sustain and to pour into us enough to care enough about ourselves notwithstanding you know so to go one of the things I've written several times in different ways is thinking about my great-grandmother and how three um over three years three women who were girls in her town several thousand people were lynched around her age, right? She was a teenager, 16, 17. And I think, how does someone sustain themselves when other 16 and 17 year old black girls are being lynched in your midst? And then she went on to have 18 children. And I asked this question, you know, how, how, you know, what is it, what does it mean to have that kind of courage? And I think, so at a certain level, it's, I really do, I hold on to like literal ancestors and also the literary and the, you know, the social and the political and the cultural. Do you want to say hi? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Just wave. Hi. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. No, um, when you say that, um, it kind of brings up when you were talking about Boot, your eldest uncle. Um, who passed away and you asked like a series of questions um, like what would he have been like what if he had lived yes. and I think that a lot about um, seeing George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and just the anti-black death that has been like uh, exploited across media and then I think about my work is in Brazil the countless uh, Miguel Octavio and João Pedro and all these young black men who uh, die every 23 minutes or are murdered every 23 minutes and also the black women and gender non-conforming and trans queer folks and it's like what could have 
what could they have been if they lived? And when you're talking about the lynching of the three girls that brought that back to me, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's, you have these questions about what is this all for? Like you said, is this a failed experiment? And grabbing onto the ancestors and going back and getting is a part of our, the responsibility and the inheritance. So thank you for, for sharing that. Yeah, you yeah. know, you're saying that years ago in, um, in uh, Bahia with uh, Sarah Johnson, with a bunch of people for the Caribbean Studies Association meeting. And there was this moment when, you know, and it was one of the first times I left my children for a significant amount of time to go. And there was this moment where my friend Sarah and I, there were children who came up to ask us for money. And everybody said, you, can, you know, if you start, you can't stop. And she turned to me and she said, these could be our children. And it, and, and it was not just, you know, and I'm always cautious about sort of making oneself like the, that could have been my child because you have to, there's a way in which that can, that can, we can mean it in a way that sounds vain. But what she was really pointing to is that this is really sort of an accident of history that these are not our children, right? Mm. And that, you know, this is, I mean, really an accident, but literally they might be our cousins, right? Um, and so, um, you know, that those, those moments of reckoning, I think we really, as a, as a political matter, we have a responsibility to ask those questions, right? At a serious, like to honor the dead in part is to say, is to think about what has been destroyed by virtue of this cruelty, you know, what possibilities. It's also a way of talking to Du Bois and his essay of the passing of the firstborn, where he says that about his child who dies. It's like, you know, maybe there's a saving grace in the fact that he doesn't have to live through white supremacy, but maybe, you know, he would have done all of these things. And that, that passage has always meant so much to me. So. Yeah, it was definitely, um Definitely, I'm, a, I'm a, an, an empath, so I feel a lot emotional person. So, um, and I remember doing another event and I had to do a reading and I just started crying um, in front of the practice, you know, and I think that people don't understand what uh, the black community has to reckon with every day. Yes. They, they, people don't get it. And um, granted, like I said before, I mean, I have children, but you still feel. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So, um, also, random question: Did Golden ever contact you? No, I did not. I was, I wasn't. I have not um, reencountered Golden. I haven't no. found him. Um, I reconnected with some folks though from that community over the past year, and um, at New City, um, which has been really wonderful. Because um, you know, you have these like memories, and then you don't know if what was important to you was as important to other when you when you lose touch with people so that was really sort of profound to to reconnect with some of my sort of chicago folks so yeah, yeah. i was like wondering i'm like i hope golden contacted you <laughs> i don't know yeah i have and i and i also and i didn't write about them but i had a lot of undocumented friends during childhood in chicago and that's another piece you know of like you know, especially in this political context, like, you know, all, of, and that's another aspect though about vulnerability in the society. Like, you lose touch with people and you really can lose people forever. It's not unusual, you know. So I hope, I still, I'm hoping. Hope so, hope so. <laughs> so um, we, um, you talk a lot about naming um, and you write something on page 106 of your book I worry that you will find yourself bound by misnaming, bound by evil forces and lies. You are remarkable boys, but we are still at risk of falling under the sway of a much um, evil world. Maybe that's why I think so much about you flying because upward bound is a direction and not the gallows. And so, um, like you said, naming is so important. Like we you discussed about being misnamed, unnamed, no, having no names um, as a people. And so your sons have very powerful names. I mean, Freeman Diallo Perry Robb and Issa Garner Robb. Um, why those names and how have you taught your children to revel in, your, in those names, in their names? Yeah, so um, 
Freeman is actually named both for the obvious meaning, right, to be a free man, and also an ancestor on his father's side who was who escaped slavery and named himself Freeman. This is his last name. Um, so the kind of process of self-naming. Um, Diallo means bold one in Malinke. Um, and that um, that name, uh, I, you know, was very, you know, the sort of, for me, many people in my family have, Af African names, see the key Swahili or West African names, and that the politics of this of the seventies was really important to my self conception, sixties and seventies, and even into the eighties. And so I wanted to carry that on with my children. Um, Issa's name has multiple meanings. It means river in Songhai. It means salvation in key Swahili. It means God is our salvation in Arabic. And Garner is my grandmother's maiden name. But I also, and it's, I, I loved it because it's a name of people who were farmers, who worked the land, who, and gar the meaning of garner is kind of to earn, but I thought about sort of all of the generations of people who worked the land with that name. And so, yes, yeah, so it, was, it was very, um, their names um, with, and I, you know, participated in, you know, was with their father as well, but this sort of very deliberate naming um I think is important generally, but there's there's a, a kind of additional import, importance when we are so often misnamed, when we are so often mischaracterized, that it has to, that you, you carry your, your name as a kind of insistence um, on a self-definition. Um, and I always thought of my name in that way. And when I was a child, I was taught not just to say that my name meant faith, but that it meant faith to believe in my people. Mm. you know that and that has been an anchor for me and so you know i i was trying to transmit that something similar for them. well you definitely did those are that's a powerful names i'm telling you right now um definitely um i, I love it and who was that isa or freeman that came in that was isa okay <laughs> And it's funny because he seems so little in the book. He had he had this like massive growth spurt this summer and like all this. Yeah, but yes, that's. I was like, oh, I thought I was expecting a smaller person, but I was like, oh. <laughs> now too, so it's just yeah. Yeah. Um. I and yeah, I have so many so many questions, but I, I'm going back to a point in the book where you um talk about how injustices have happened like with your children and how you've had to learn to bottle up your rage. So, you know, um, you know, just to bottle it up and not explode. And so during these times, how have you been able to deal with, with that, with everything going on? Um, I'm just really trying to, uh, I know I keep at like maybe asking a similar question, but um, I really guess want to hit point home to everyone who's non-black on this call that what we're feeling is not a game. This is not, we're, we're not, this is not play play. And um, I really just want to like hear your thoughts about that too. Yeah. I, and I describe it as, uh, and I really do mean it. There's moments in which I feel as though I, I, my behavior is sinful because I, there are moments when my children have experienced injustice. And if I were telling the truth fully, you know, to, the institutions or the individuals, right, who had treated my children unjustly, I would be putting them in undeniable risk of complete marginalization. And so I, um, so I, I, I bite my tongue mm -hmm. and I, I feel it, a sense of responsibility to do it, but also a deep sense of shame. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you see people who mistreat your children and you don't have the full force of rage that they deserve unleashed on them, right? Because you're trying to figure out how to navigate the world. I just did a lecture on Baldwin's The Fire Next Time yesterday, and one of the things that I, um, I talked about is the way in that book, which is an influence on, on this one, he really is talking about the various ways that Black people figure out how to navigate this world and the in a fashion that's livable, which always requires some degree of hustle. And so you can't, I mean, you literally, if you want to live, you can't be completely honest. Yeah. And it's, it's so it's, it's, and so that's why the kind of intellectual 
skills and the emotional sophistication that is required to come of age as a black person in this society is extraordinary. Yes. I'm so furious when people say talk about things like grit in black children. Who's grittier? Right? I mean, in terms of figuring out, you know, at such a small age, right? And we, you know, I'm sure you have stories and I have too, where you you realize you're seeing how people are seeing you. Mm-hmm. In addition to seeing, right? And you have to learn to distinguish between an external assessment and your internal assessment, your internal standard. Um, you have to, so all of these registers from a tight age, how to make sense of them, how to navigate them. And so, um, and I wanted to be honest about the injustice of those expectations, but also the extraordinary brilliance that black people have to acquire in order to navigate this world. That's why it's just so, it's, it's laughable that people act as though um, black people have fewer skills or uh, are not competent, right? It requires an enormous amount of confidence just to function. Yeah. And that reminded me a lot of Citizen, an, um, an American lyric by Claudia Rankine, where she was like asking the question, like this very like, um, I was talking to a, a friend of mine and I'm like, the psychological warfare that black people have to go through where you know, and you mentioned it too, where you know someone is looking at you as some sort of way or they think that you're not smart or they think that you can't speak their language or they think that you're incompetent and whatnot. And then it's like, did they, did they just say that to me or did they just think that of me? And then when you address it, they switch up. Yep. And you know, like, or they make you the angry black woman or the angry, you know, all these things. And how many, how many things every day daily that black people have to swallow? to survive. And so, um, and I know that was like times 10 with having, you know, children. Yeah. Um, I've seen my parents go, what, what are they zero to 100? Um, <laughs> really quick. And the consequences of that. Right. 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 And it's, you always, you're right. You always have to, and you have to figure out which battles you're going to fight. Yeah. 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 Definitely. And so I can continue to talk like to use, but I'm going to be fair to other people <laughs> because they have some questions and I got, I, I just, yeah, I'm going to, I'm not going to take up all the time, but so someone asked, uh, Florence Goff asked, what was the age of your children and what was their reaction when you spoke to them about witnessing your struggles as a black woman? Oh, so, okay, so I am a person, I'll preface this by saying, I'm a person who feels as though there are many ways to parent well. Mm-hmm. And the challenge of the parent is to figure out their particular way of parenting well. So I have always talked to my children about race, about gender, about sexuality, about gender identity, about class, like from very tiny age, right? Um, so I can't, I almost can't remember. And it wasn't even sort of a sit down, let's have a conversation about it. It was, let's notice the world around us. And then one of the first lessons I remember, and they were, you know, maybe each around three where I would, we would take the train and I would say, um, and you know this, cause you know how the, how SEPTA is. And, um, in Philly, I'd be like, how does a person who uses a walker or a wheelchair get into this station? Mm-hmm. And then they would, say, I don't, they can't, right? And so I would talk about what does it mean to build environments to exclude, right? So not not the later lesson about accessibility, but you built, you know, they, these structures were built to keep certain people out from the outset and to try to use that to think about everything. What does it mean when, you know, when you're five years old and the class song is, you know, that everybody's saying is heteronormative, Right. Who are you excluding by telling, you know, a song about falling in love that has, you know, only opposite gender constructions, right? Like these. And so, um, and specifically about, you know, being a black woman, my, I mean, you know, there's, <laughs> there's lessons every day and as someone, and for them also growing up with, with a mother with chronic diseases, it becomes really evident, right? Because I have all these experiences with the medical establishment all the time that I have deconstructed for them, right? Why, when I, you know, do people turn me, why, why do I have to fight to have folks respond to my pain? Why do I have to, I mean, 
so yeah, so it's it's really literally been. I can't remember not having so it's sort of at the age where they started to be able to have conversations that were sophisticated. Right, we're just chilling around three. Yeah. So. Wow, and um, you talk about. Um, your chronic illnesses in the book, and you've been very open about them. And it reminds me um, of my mother. She just celebrated her one year kidney transplant anniversary, uh, September 20th, after having her first one fail. Um, and ever since I was undergrad, I've seen my mom be super mom, and but still go to dialysis three times a week, um, still counsel other people while dealing with uh, end-stage renal kidney failure. And so I'm wondering how do you um, sustain yourself and how do you center like yourself um, outside of being mom, outside of being uh, the scholar, writer, professor, and all these things that you do, how do you center yourself and your health? Um, you know, it's it, it ebbs and flows. Sometimes I'm better at it than others. Mm -hmm. you know? So I, um, from the very beginning, I made a decision earned distrust of um, a lot, you know, I had of a lot of physicians. And so I read everything I possibly could each time I was diagnosed with a different chronic disease, literally everything I could find, medical journals, books and the like. I've used food as medicine, acupuncture, complementary and alternative medicine, which of course is, is classed, right? I mean, a lot of my ability to do some of those things had to do with having resources. Um, Although thankfully now there's more community acupuncture in various ways, but it a, a lot of it is sort of sort of trying to take control of my own medical care. But I'll be completely frank, it's it's challenging in a society which is so privatized. I don't live near my family, right? Where everything is so individual, we don't do a lot of community care, and so there are moments in which I have had medical crises that could have been avoided with the diff which I know could have been avoided if our just our our my social world was structured differently and it's been a kind of ongoing struggle to try to figure out mm -hmm. what I can do you know um, so I don't really have it totally figured out <laughs> just try <laughs> yeah definitely I, I completely understand um yes in dealing with the medical neglect and uh, medical apartheid and, uh, you know, discriminate, like, you know, also, I, I really saw that definitely when uh, acting as if you're not, my mother's not in pain or, you know, it's just very, I mean, like, I'm just sitting here like, wow, it's, it's just very interesting, uh, that experience navigating the medical industrial complex, I should say. My uh, grandmother used to say, you know, before she passed, she, I remember distinctly one occasion where she looked at a doctor, she was always very outspoken. And she said, I know you don't care nothing about me because I'm old and black. And he said, no, no, that's not true. He, she's yes, it is. <laughs> right. And then insisted upon better care. And it was, you know, I was like, I, I, she was one of those people I learned from, right. The frame was, was always, there's a deficiency on the part of the person who's neglecting you. And that also is, is helpful to keep, you know, to keep in mind because people will act like, you know, expecting something basic is outrageous, you know. And I was like, let me get out of this. I will tear this hospital right. up. <laughs> you like, want to tear it up, right? <laughs> yes. And then I get in trouble. No, but it, seriously, it, it's, it's to be Black and to navigate just all sorts of structures, but the medical industrial complex is something I've never, I mean, it's just so, so much. And so thank you for being open and honest and, and thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and there's another question, Michael Richardson asks, how did you process this book with your sons and how did they react and did any questions come up for them? So um, a couple of things, um, I mean, part of it, so they, I gave them veto power. So there's, there are lots of stories that I wanted to put in that are not in. Um, there's a kind of distance though, you know, so the, the, the topics we cut, we talk about in various ways. We've talked about it for years. There's a distance in, um, in, cause a book is an artifact, right? Mm -hmm. And a relationship is a relationship. So it is an interesting artifact, 
but in their experience, it doesn't, it's not our relationship. Right. So they liked it. You know, it's kind of cool to have people know their name, <laughs> read the book. You know, sometimes with my younger son, he's come to signings with me and people ask him to sign the book. That's cool. But, you know, that's sort of the extent of it. Um, and I have I really try to be deliberate about um, sustaining a line of separation between my public facing life and my life as a parent. Um for their protection and their, you know, so that they don't ever feel pressured into engaging in that world or even, um, and, and they may not ever want to, but also don't feel sort of um, made spectacles of. And so, uh, but I also, you know, I will see, right? Because they're young. They may, 10 years from now, they may be like, you really should not have written that book. No, don't say that. <laughs> You know, we make, listen, parents make mistakes. And one of the things I know is that you have to be prepared to just to accept it when you are confronted with mistakes that you've made as a parent. So I have, you know, I'm, I'm working hard to not be the person like, I tried my best and just be like ready to accept if they say, you know, this really didn't work for me. So. No, I mean, I remember you said that in the book, look, they're, they're gifted writers, so if they want to write another, you know. Right. I mean. They might. <laughs> That's just completely wrong. Yes. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm always, I was in awe with just, like, I know that you said you wrote this not for your sons, but for other people as well, but just, like, the, the like, I keep going back to vulnerability, like because we've had we have these private conversations, me and my homegirls, yeah. uh, my my parents, um, my siblings, you know, extended family about these very discussions, yeah. um, and then to have this book and really this love letter, these love letters to your sons come together and and it just hits you. Um, I think you just said something about a James Baldwin quote. I'm I'm didn't write it down and I should have, but. Um, reading makes you feel like you're not alone or are you, yes. Yeah, no, that's the, you, that's the thing that you think that your, you know, your problems, I don't remember verbatim, but that they're singular, right? And then you read and you want, you understand you're not alone, right? And what, and there, so there's a the part of sort of wanting to, to testify, right? To a set of experiences, to a, a tradition. And there's also a part that's, I don't know quite how to say it, but there's in the public arena, there's also been a flattening of black experience in the wake of all of this violence, all of the state violence, all of the suffering, um, a reduction of us to those moments. And the, the, the violence of the reduction is, of course, that then people aren't forced to deal with the absolute preciousness of black life that makes the destruction so horrific. Right. Mm -hmm. so it's like if you don't if you if you if there's not a witnessing to what's incredible right it's almost like a, and i think i do think there's been a complete desensitization i don't like the circulation of i mean i think they're like you know honestly they function like snuff videos they're pornographic the circulation of images of and people argued with me and, and early on i said if if someone needs to see a black person die to believe it we're already starting from a place of moral failure I mean, I just, that's how I, but, but I want, you know, I, I really wanted a kind of a, a, a more robust, fuller portrait of the we, mm -hmm. of the space, right? Um, and I felt like, I feel like our children in particular deserve that. They deserve, I mean, it's one of my issues with a lot of the sort of the way people are approaching anti-racism in elementary and high school. And so the way that black people enter the curriculum is like being taught that racism is bad, which is all well and good, but could you teach something about black people's lives too, right? You know, we're more than the experience of racism. You know, yeah. Much, much more, yeah. Definitely, I think about this moment, um, I couldn't watch George Floyd, I, I saw half of it and I was, I was like, I'm done. I don't need to see it, I don't, and then, on social media, people retweeting videos and, and just, it's just been so much. But when we look back in history and, and at this time, and there's a lot to write about this time, um, <laughs> so much, but I just don't want 
George Floyd to be that video or Eric Garner to be that video or Breonna Taylor or Tony McDade or Nina Pop or, you know, you know, we're, we're just more than, than yes. that. And, and even like, um, I, I, my, one of my professors at Howard, um, you know, we're taught to say slaves and he would correct us all the time, enslaved, enslaved Africans, enslaved peoples. Um, we are more than, um, and there's, and we shouldn't, like you said in the book, we shouldn't be ashamed of where we come from and, and, and on how resilient of a people we are. But beyond that, we right. cry. We, I mean, like we shouldn't have to say this, yeah. but you know, yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, and I'll add one of the things that initially made me so upset is that this, you know, the, the circulation of so many of these images happened on corporate platforms. Literally capital was accumulated over the spectacle of the murders of black people. And they would repeat without warnings in a way that there's, I, I do not believe that it, were there, were there killings of white people that were comparable? They would not circulate in that fashion. So there's a real, an ethical problem, both in terms of like, you know, the capital accumulation over it and also the sort of the disregard for, 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 for black life. And, um, and I do, right. And so it's also like, what will be the artifact later? Right. What will, what will, which is exactly the point that you're raising. What will, how will this moment be remembered? Will they, will their lives be reduced, you know, to these snippets, right? Or will they be, and I, I, I do think something quite beautiful has happened. A lot of organizers have kind of re, have, have reclaimed Im- the images, reclaimed the narratives in order to, to, to um, honor them as people, people who have been murdered. Yeah. No, I think, excuse me, I think about that um, never in my life would have thought that these corporations would have Black Lives Matter blasted uh, or pay, uh, all over, you know, on basketball courts and, and on billboards and all these sorts of things, but still yet even in that performative activism still won't address what we want or what we need or, or what we're demanding. And it's just skirting around everything else, but we're not racist. Well, you know, we have Black Lives, we have a diversity hire um, and I'm really concerned about the commodification of lang- of like you were talking about of radical movements um, and the pacification of these movements, especially through social media. Um, and what we're about to embark on um, in this next coming months, um, particularly yeah, yeah. with this this election, I'm just very concerned about that um, and the chronic desensitization. And also the militarization of 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 this of this nation, um, and also just you know having a transnational lens because we're not the only ones. And so um, yeah, and you know, you do that doing work in Brazil. I mean, you know, it's I saw somebody talking mm. about oh well maybe you know talking about on social media leaving this country and talking about going to Brazil, and I'm thinking, well, do you know what's happening there? I mean, you know, like it's you really do especially now, given that these forces are global, it's important to, to know, just to know how comprehensive they are, right? Um, yeah, so. Yeah, and so, I mean, in, in wrapping up and like I said, I could talk you, like, I don't know, I could talk to you forever, but um, thinking about the future and then going back to the first question I asked you and dreaming and imagining and creating new worlds, what would a world look like for you? What would you dream of a world um, for you and your sons? Or what would the world look like for you um, and your sons if you imagine it to be? Yeah, so I have, you know, I answer this in a, in a couple of ways. I mean, I really think a lot about right relations. And by that, I mean, you know, how to focus in at the very basic level about what it means to be in decent relation to the people around us and the earth around us and how we cultivate that, how we cultivate um, a politics that begins with love and care, um, with sensitivity, with humanity, with and, uh, and with respect for the environment, right? All of those sorts of things. Um, and seeing that as sort of the core 
um, the kind of base goal of people's lives. And then I think at a sort of, in what is a more classically political level, I, I'm really interested in um, going into histories of social movements and thinking in, not in terms of sort of early strategies, but the very idea of how to exercise leverage and how to stage organizing. Right. So like I was having this conversation with my mother the other night and I was like, you know, I was talking about the Montgomery bus boycott. And I was like, well, that, you know, that could be in the way that it was because black people were the majority of bus riders and it's a local bus company. How do you do that with a multinational corporation? Right. How do you exercise leverage um, in a local community when these institutions are now global? Right. How do you do it? How do you how do you organize around the question of surveillance where you don't you nobody needs and in, someone infiltrate anymore because they can see everything that that we do right and so really sort of I I really am hoping that we can focus as much on our values our belief about how the society should be organized on how to start to think really seriously mm-hmm. you know about how people organize themselves to operate against these massive forces, right? Um, and that I think is incredibly hard work. It requires a lot of thought. You know, I love my, that Ida B. Wells quote, people must know before they can act. I think that's really true, you know, and so we're frustrated and we want to, you know, we want to speak out and do, but there's a lot of thought work that has to be done. And so I guess my vision is is a life you know, for the remainder of my years on this planet to be devoted in large part to that thought work. Well, you are doing the damn thing, Dr. Perry. I'm telling you right now, um, you contributed so much and we learned so much from you um, and six books and just even more. It's just beyond you writing. It's, It's just thank you for everything. It's been I feel like I'm on cloud nine. Hopefully I can go to sleep after this because I did not sleep before. Oh, yes, get some good rest. We need it. I was so nervous to speak with you. <laughs> so it was just such a joyful conversation. It so, really was. Well, and I'm, I, I hope one day soon we'll actually meet in person. <laughs> so. I would, now that I know that you are, like, you know, we have so many connections. Um, yes, I would love that, hopefully, and Thank you for just this amazing work and inspiring. Oh, actually, there's one more question. I'm so sorry. Someone else has a question for you. Um, Can you talk about the intersection of race and climate justice, climate justice in the context of our kids and they're growing up in this world? Yeah. So um, I will speak from a position that is not wholly sophisticated, but I'll, I'm going to say it this way. And it's partly because I'm, I'm working on my next book is on the South. So I'm thinking about this a lot. And I think so much of the way in which the society functions, where we, um, you know, ex- exploit labor, exploit people's physical vulnerabilities, work the land to death, right? See its bounty and destroy it, right? All of that really sort of has an inception point with with the genocide and slavery at the founding of the nation. And it becomes, it became a practice. Um, And so, you know, so I think a lot about what does it mean for the Deep South to be sort of the front line of, of, of climate disaster right now. And, you know, when I was a kid, because you know, I grew up around activists and organizers, and they sort of looked askance at the environmentalists, like you care about, you know, birds and, and whales, and you don't care about people. And now we understand that there's no, you, there's no separation. The thing that I talk to my kids about a lot is, yes, we recycle, yes, we, but the reality is that this is not a privatized problem. Mm. If the policies, right? The corporations have to be forced to behave differently if we're going to arrest this problem. We could do all the recycling in the world, but if there's no, you know, as long as they're, they are pumping poison everywhere, right? Um, you know, the dead zones in the Gulf Coast, the sick, you know, the, 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 the Mississippi River being, um, uh, being so filthy and all these um, places. And so I sort of, to, to sort of think not in a private way, but actually think in a collective way 
And it goes back to the question of how do we dream a world? And they have the opportunity, I think, to be much more sophisticated in seeing the connections, not sort of siphoning off one issue. And I love Generation Z because they so often talk you know, comprehensively. They don't tend to talk about sort of, you know, niche or sweet issues. They talk about, I mean, it's witnessing my, the conversations my kids and their friends have. And so in some ways I want to listen even more than I want to um, prescribe or interpret. Definitely. Oh, and also too, just last question. I'm like, I'm not going to ask you more. You're writing another book. So uh, <laughs> you should have never threw that out there. I was like, oh, you're writing another book. <laughs> Do you mind speaking about that a little bit? <laughs> yeah, it's it's called South to America. Uh, the argument is that um, the South is really the heartland of the nation. That it has that our politics, that our policies have always um, been driven by, or um, uh, sort of in service of, or kind of. The, the country always moves around that axis point. And so it's important to under, we want to understand the nation and its history and its practices. That's where we have to go. And more specifically, we have to look at the black South because the black South is really, you can't get to understanding it unless you get to understand. So like, so it started with this phenomenon that, you know, every year there's a ton of like travel books about the South, right? I mean, every year. And a lot of them do quite well. And I'm thinking like, aren't people ever going to get tired of this genre, right? But it's because everybody's like, oh, that's a quirky, weird region where it's like, you know, like that's all the, where all the strange stories are and the ghosts and what have you. And so, you know, and there is this beautiful storytelling tradition, but there's also a way in which it is totally misconstructed and misconstrued as this sort of other place where the bad things happen and the weird people are, as opposed to being really the place that the nation learns its practices from for better and worse. Right. So I'm editing now. Oh my, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> Bless me with, with this, this work that, I mean, this <laughs> magic that you have. Oh my goodness. is writing. That's so amazing. And no, I'm I, I mentioned my mother's side of the family is from Arkansas, and I actually was able to teach for a summer in Arkansas. And um, I was down there thinking, like, wow, we've forgotten the South and our uh, radical black uh, praxis at times. We forgot about how the South is the center um, of everything that we've learned. And um, we really need to recenter this, like, you know, black Southern organizers, particularly um, black feminist Southern organizers and the amazing work that they're doing. Um, I think about New Orleans, it was 15 years since Hurricane Katrina and um, you know, how people have been able to survive, these organizers have been able to uh, rebuild after uh, such tragedy. And so, and just all sorts of amazing work that's happening. So I cannot wait, I will be purchasing. <laughs> Um, I, I can't believe like, this is amazing. So thank you so much, Dr. Perry. It's really an honor and, um, um, you've made my evening. So you made my rest of my week and the rest of the month. So thank you so much. So nice to talk to you. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>